Hello, welcome to my BSD Cam Talk, a personal free BSD deployment. Uh, these are little things that I wish I had known before uh, starting a free BSD deployment. Uh, let's uh, dive right into it then. Uh, a little bit about me, I am a software consultant uh, working in Berlin. I'm working for uh, Port Zero, which is a consultancy that specializes in security and uh, networks. Uh, we are always looking for interesting work, uh, so if you have some, please reach out. Uh, what do I mean by personal deployment? Uh, it, in, it involves my laptop uh, and a bunch of servers. Uh, laptop uh, and obviously laptop is like laptop and other daily drivers that I use. It caters to my personal needs. Uh, it runs services uh, that more or less only used by me. Uh, there are exceptions but the system is not designed for it. It it's all uh, I also knew that this is always going to be very small. Uh, in terms of machines that it manages or the complexity that uh, it will have or rather I didn't want it to have enough complexity that it becomes a nightmare to maintain so automation was not really a big deal I wanted it to be small and stay small what does it run? Uh, as of now it runs a bunch of services uh, mostly on the servers uh, like email, uh, storage blog and some services that are some supporting services that are needed for other services functions like monitoring uh, LDAP for authentication and so and so. Uh, in the early, very early in the project I decided that uh, I'm gonna use FreeBSD uh, for it and it was a mix of curiosity and fun. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm not. I'm really not going to go into the go into deep about why I chose it. Uh, but uh, we can we can talk about it after the talk if you're interested. Uh, but having made that decision, I had to make uh, some other ones. Uh, the main one being where do I run it? Uh, whether I should run it in a machine that's uh, owned by me completely. Uh, as in I would buy a server, put it up uh, in my apartment or some colo and then use it. Um, this has a nice, this provides you with a nice feature that you own the complete platform uh, but it also comes with some caveats as in uh, this is going to be extremely expensive in terms of initial investment and also um, collocation where I live is uh, pretty expensive like way more than uh, what you would actually pay for the the server if you're not buying new servers and and uh, running it in my apartment was also not a great idea because the where i live the internet is not that great uh, so more or less that pushed me to choose a provider uh, that would run the service for me luckily there are multiple providers which provide you with a platform that can run what I need and the, these are the ones that I compared uh, AWS is pretty big everybody knows uh, them and has a lot extensive set of managed services that one can use uh, if they were building it out but for me uh, since this is going to be very small and more or less manually maintained uh, most of those feature set didn't make any sense and AWS is also the most expensive uh, service in the mix so that was a strict no uh, I want this to run forever which meant I also wanted it to be a bit more sustainable DigitalOcean and Vulture are pretty good because they have uh, they provide you with cloud machines and they have first class support for FreeBSD in their platform so you can just like go and pull up a FreeBSD machine they're up and they were strong contenders uh, the other service that I checked out and also finally started uh, using is Hetzner uh, they are a German provider uh, they are a bit behind on the whole 
cloud uh, infrastructure thing. Uh, they do have a cloud offering. Mm. But what they shine at is uh, they give you physical machines and uh, from their used market, which are pretty cheap, about 30 euros so a month. And they're pretty beefy machines and they support FreeBSD on it. And that's the option that I chose. Uh, I also run few machines on their cloud infrastructure, but uh, FreeBSD on their cloud is a second class citizen. Uh, what I meant by that is you first you need to boot a Linux machine and then you swap over for a FreeBSD boot image and then you gotta go into BSD install. So setting up that machine is a bit of painful, but if you're not, it, it I mean it is more or less unusable without a lot of work if you are trying to build out a cloud first platform on that uh, system but if it for me uh, I have a bunch of servers that more or less never changes so the, f the first spending like 10 minutes doing that uh, in the beginning was fine uh, even though I do want to look into automating that install uh, eventually anyway so uh, I have now uh, the platform to run it and the machines running. So how do I go about building this infrastructure? Uh, I'm coming from a, a Docker background and so whenever you look up any internet documentation and talk to anybody, the first answer, as you all might know, or most of you might will know, uh, most of you know, uh, the answer is always uh, jails are like Docker. Uh, but this was not really helpful to me uh, because the abstraction level where these tools operate are entirely different. Uh, Docker is a one-shot tool. Uh, you use it and you read the documentation and you can start and run your services with it and that's all you need. Uh, but uh, jails are... The jails play in a different level so as to say because jails is not a feature in isolation uh, rather a piece of the puzzle and you also need rest of the uh, bits that uh, your operating system provides to build the service that you actually want to use or that you can actually use uh, when you think about it this is a more holistic approach uh, at building out systems but that obviously also makes the learning curve really really steep i i, I know that like higher level uh, jail management tools like io cage or is a is jail exist but once you like when you start reading their documentation knowing nothing uh, i have found that it's not uh, it expects you to have some knowledge that i didn't possess that that time uh, and also uh, all the documentation that I could find when I started this project which is around 2017 was also not great the handbook uh, the handbook part on jails uh, had uh, deprecated documentation and uh, was not covering everything that I thought it would uh, but I've gone back and checked now, like I've compared the, the archive.org copy uh, back then uh, to now and I'm really happy that the jails documentation has improved a lot and uh, it uh, uses all the new uh, methods and uh, whatnot. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to the, the article jails the hard way because it also helped me uh, understand this this. Uh, abstraction better than anything else. So what do I mean by jails is not a feature in isolation. For me, uh, my services say I wanted to run my web server in a jail, uh, so I would need to know obviously how jails work and how to operate on them, uh, but I would also need to know uh, how my uh, firewall interacts with the network because I obviously want to get in and out, uh, packets get in and out of the jail. And I also want to uh, need to learn how a package works around uh, jails. Uh, these seem uh, not so big uh, in 
hindsight but having to know that fact that it's if you just have jail uh, you also need to use other tooling that FreeBSD gives you so that sort of like um, relationship was hard for me to make so that's that's one thing that I would um, teach myself uh, if I could uh, before jumping into this the the other um, sorry okay the next bit of uh, uh, feature I had to do was make sure all of my data is encrypted uh, starting with I mean encryption is as a layered approach and full disk encryption is not a silver bullet to solve all your your problems but it is all it it at least solves the problem that um, my hard disks that I'm going to run uh, if they end ever end up in somewhere and uh, somebody is trying to extract the data I can make their life a bit harder so I really wanted to start with uh, the lowest level error that I could um, but it, it was tricky in in couple of ways um, if you so um, a naive way would be install FreeBSD on a completely encrypted disk and once you boot uh, your bootloader uh, will ask you to decrypt your disk and um, you, you boot in the system and this is pretty straightforward but once you don't have access to out of band access to that server uh, you you really can't uh, deploy that because you need some way to talk to the server while it's booting uh, which means you can't involve any of the infrastructure that you usually use to talk to the machine so what I ended up using which is a it's more or less copied from another uh, community member is um, splitting my disk into two uh, so uh, like my one uh, most of my servers have two disks and they're all on uh, RAID 1 uh, because I, I care about my data uh, and so those disks are uh, split into two partitions uh, one uh, contains the root uh, which is not encrypted and the uh, rest of the data is on a partition that is encrypted uh, using Jelly but it does not uh, really matter how you encrypt it uh, this design will hold uh, so once you start the machine it boots off the root and uh, which it can do because it's not encrypted and there is an init script uh, that uh, I've added and it uh, this is the metadata for that inner script it runs before this and it provides jelly serial target uh, which uh, i guess it, in this case doesn't really matter it's just a name but what's more important is what it does so you can see from line three to eight that it starts uh, essential services for you to actually access it over the network and then it waits uh, on a loop uh, continuously uh, checking if the disks are available so this is your queue to connect to that system decrypt the disks which breaks the loop on uh, line 14 um, and then you can see the script like brings down all the services that you start it started one off and then uh, the system resumes booting uh, this means that uh, you don't have to use any out of band access your disks that contain the data relevant to you is still encrypted uh, obviously this is not this is not I mean this has more like a bit more holes than a fully encrypted system as in you know somebody could tamper your root of us but as you know with encryption this is cat and mouse game and I the, the security that I was looking for is, like I said, uh, somebody exfiltrating data from my hard disk. So that works pretty well for me. So when I, when I started, um, 
I, 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 I told like as I mentioned, like automation was not a uh, main or like a big goal for the system because it was always going to be small, and uh, I thought I could maintain it. Uh, because I knew some automation would be more or less straightforward, uh, like updating your system, uh, renewing your certificate, these are all things that you can, well, quote and unquote automate with uh, just Chrome jobs. But there were a lot of stuff that I did not think would be the case and that's what threw me off. This is one of the learnings that I had after running the system. You will end up building a lot of packages, uh, meaning uh, FreeBSD provides packages with a lot of options and there are obviously default options, but if you ever need a package to be built without a default option, uh, you are on your own, you're, you're going to compile it from boards. Uh, and I ended up doing this a lot. Um, my jails and after a while it got a really mess where uh, every time I need to update something uh, I need to go compile a bunch of packages on each of the jails that I run and I had no clue what came from where and it got like really really hard to maintain uh, so as you would see like rest of the talk um, the, the or you have already seen I guess um, the common workflow for me in that scenario is uh, pastel community and somebody will uh, help me solve my problem and that's what also happened in this uh, case. Uh, I was complaining about it and someone um, pointed me at uh, Pottery and uh, it it's a pretty amazing tool uh, to build um, a lot of packages uh, in an isolated fashion and also uh, give you a package repo without making all your jails uh, messy and uh, it, it's also pretty easy to use and uh, yeah the most difficult thing about the about uh, pottery was uh, learning to pronounce it I still have trouble spelling it but um, whatever um, with uh, just three commands you have a jail running that runs the version that you want and uh, build all the packages that you need and and you have a package rep already and this is this is pretty nice than uh, tooling that I'm used to in other uh, especially other Linux distributions uh, so so just just going back so this ended up uh, being something that I had to automate. So I had to build out a power ray system and then uh, make sure that all my packages get built on a likely fashion that I, so that I can uh, update them. Uh, the other thing that I had to plan for was uh, you will end up building tree a lot, uh, which is was kind of counterintuitive because I uh, like always started using stable uh, release branches and then stuck with release branches. But the problem is uh, for some like weird issues that I had mostly on my laptop. The 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 first response always was, "Have you tried it on current? Has it been fixed on current?" And it got to a point where I. I expected to get that answer and like I decided to run current on the machines that I have um, which is not something that I planned for and this was pretty bad uh, I ran it like uh, I ran current on my laptop for like for a few months like maybe for five months and every time I had to rebuild uh, it, my laptop is not a powerful machine it takes about six hours to build the tree uh, and um, so I would keep it on uh, overnight uh, hoping that it would uh, finish and uh, not uh, die uh, and it was frustrating but uh, someone uh, in the mailing list uh, helped me 
uh, figure out the fact that you can actually uh, do sort of a remote build. I am not entirely sure how con uh, how stable this is, but this has so far not failed me. Uh, as long as your CPU and architecture uh, matches, I am sure if I run a, an entirely different microarchitecture, this might blow up. I'm not sure. Mm. Uh, you can sync your uh, object directory and uh, source directory, and then you can just you just need to install stuff on your uh, machine. So that's what I ended up doing. Uh, I have a job that runs on a pretty beefy server that builds the tree when I want it, and then I just rsync these two folders to my laptop, and then mm, it gets installed. Uh, and that helped me not run my laptop to death uh, on a super fast way. So this is something that I'm still working on. Uh, remember when I said I don't really care about updating my laptop, uh, my uh, machines uh, once in a while, but as my services grew, uh, I had to update uh, 10 or so jails and the machines uh, so it got to a point where I really really wanted to fix it uh, not automate it but at least reduce the job uh, I've been uh, told about uh, using sort of a thin jail uh, template approach I'm still working on it so I thought I would finish but that's why it's here uh, alright uh, so that's it for me. Uh, here's a bunch of references uh, to the things that I mentioned in the talk. And uh, I want to say thanks to people that I uh, that helped me out uh, during this this project. Uh, Fox helped me understand Jails a lot, uh, and Philip is the one that gave me the original disk encryption script, uh, which I modified a bit, and. Uh, uh, FreeBSD questions and current for uh, trying to solve my, all my problems and fixing most of them. Um, thank you everyone. Uh, bye, have a nice day.